Welcome to our fourth uh, producer Q&A. This is going to be a Halloween special featuring the film hub favorite title, horror comedy, The Setting. And uh, today is actually the first time we have pretty much the entire crew, which is amazing. Thank you for, for the time and thank you for putting this together. So let me uh, introduce everyone properly. So first we have uh, Gabe and Ella. You've seen both in the uh, film on screen, but you may not know there are also producers and writers behind the screen. And they are screenwriters, performers, and filmmakers best known for the setting. And then they made uh, The Onion Divine Meets the Apocalypse, which is an amazing film also on Film Hub. I highly recommend you check it out. And uh, they also made several episodes uh, of the popular animated series Bee and Poppycat Lazy in Space that's currently on Netflix. Uh, next up, we have Emily Liu, the director of the film. Her directing career started in theater. Her work on uh, Roy Conboy's solo show culminated at the Mark Taper Forum. She later directed uh, Marcus Gadley's Living Tired at Yale Summer Cabaret. The setting is her first feature, and she's currently in development of her second feature, Diablo Shadows. We have uh, Chad Musurf, who's the editor of the film. He has produced and directed multiple independent features and have won awards at festivals across the country. He has recently turned his attention to fine art and is looking to create new animated content combining handmade technique with digital processes. We have uh, Matthias. Matthias Schubert is a cinematographer. He has shot more than 40 features and has worked alongside filmmakers such as Werner Herzog and Ruhe uh, Kitamura and also with music powerhouses such as Billie Eilish, Olivia Rodrigo, and Katy Perry. Then we have uh, Jeff Mann. He's a drummer, multi-instrumentalist and producer, uh, and film composer based in LA. He's originally from New York and has toured and recorded extensively with the Antibalas Afrobeat Orchestra. His scoring credits include features, documentaries, and video games, and national TV ads. He's currently the drummer of LA-based psychedelic rock band, Here Lies Man. Wow, we have a reunion party here. Is this <laughs> the first time you are in the same room, like since the film? It's maybe since the LA premiere? <laughs> oh, yeah. wow, wow. Thank you, yeah. At least with Emily, I haven't seen yeah, Emily. No, Emily. Emily is the one that made it difficult because the rest of us made the other movie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess last but not least, let me introduce my co-host, our founder, Klaus Badelt, who you've just met. Uh, so before Film Hub, Klaus has written music to over 80 films, to name just a few, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, the Beijing Olympics, the Time Machine, Equilibrium, and the Pledge. So uh, Klaus, uh, yeah, I had my share of Werner Herzog as well, yes, so <laughs> <laughs> in a good way. Yeah, <laughs> I have nothing bad to say. No, the opposite. I was actually, I remember I was this super young guy for, and he, he, I was asked to do the music and I hadn't met him before and I only knew about the other Klaus who he tortured almost to death on, Klaus Kinski. Yeah. Um, and it's well documented. So I was really scared. I mean, literally, I was scared. Like when he comes in, like he's going to just smack me or something or drag me into something bad. Um, but he was the most amazing, nicest, um, reasonable guy to work with, you know. <laughs> so um, can, you, you, you probably know, right? Yeah, he was exactly like I wanted him to be, basically. <laughs> Straightforward, very German. Everything, yeah. everything I imagined. It was just the five-day uh, documentary on the Killers before he directed the concert in um, in New York. We did a small documentary on the Killers in right. Las Vegas. <laughs> he probably thought with your name you're German. <laughs> Definitely half Austrian, half German. Uh -huh. Now I still thought my I got my first job in LA because the director thought he. I mean, he has a very German name, and I thought my agent probably thought that the director was actually German was Kurt Wimmer, um, who is anything but anything but German, the most un-German guy I've ever met. But his dad was like obsessed with German names, so that's why he was named like that. Oh, that's funny. I always assumed he was German. Yeah, no, no, zero. Oh my God. He looked more like Dirk Diggler, I would say, if he's in the same room. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay. All right. So I guess let's you. first. Yeah. So <laughs> let's first talk about the making of the film. Uh, what's the inception of uh, the selling, and how did you put together this amazing crew? Emily, do you want to start? Uh, the inception of the film. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, I was pregnant with my now seventeen-year-old son, and my and I called up Gabe. Do you remember the call? I do, but I'm still I'm sort of like reeling from seventeen-year-old uh, son and want to end <laughs> this conversation entirely. Yeah, that math doesn't check out. <laughs> yeah, think, he's uh, legit almost an adult. It's really crazy. <laughs> I think I think you're mistaken. He's eight. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. He's ever going to be forever eight. Yeah. Um, and then I knew I wanted to make a movie and I knew I wanted to do it collaboratively with someone that I had worked with before and really trusted and that was also interested in making that transition. And Gabe and I had kept in touch. We had gone to college together and done some work together in college and after college a little. And we had a little theater company together in college and um and yeah and so we decided we were going to make it we we're going to make a movie for a hundred thousand dollars right <laughs> that was it and yeah. and uh and that's what started it but and from then we came up with a concept and Gabe would write and we would we, you can take it from here Gabe but we would it would we would go back and forth for years before we called up Trevor, but you you go take it, Gabe. Uh, yeah, I we talked about what assets we had, and she had a <laughs> house that she that we could shoot in, um, which we didn't end up using eventually. But um, it was like, well, what can we do in a house? And yeah, we sort of built the script around things we had, and then ended up not using most of them. Right. <laughs> Uh, I had I always loved ghost stories as a kid growing up and uh, was just fascinated by them. Loved um, ghost comedies. You know, uh, Saturday afternoon there was a there's a Don Knotts movie called The Ghost of Mr. Chicken that I always watched whenever it was on. Abbott Costello movies, and I think that um, I just you know I no one had ever done like a real estate aid, like the person who sells the house to the it's always the house gets sold to the people and about them dealing with it and. I was just really uh, interested in that and really interested in how re real people would react uh, in that sort of situation in a, in a comedic way. And so um, I uh, learned how to write screenplays from scratch. I had no idea and was like reinventing the wheel and then finally got some books and I was like, oh, okay, structure is a thing. And uh, and we kind of eventually um, got it together. Yeah. But we we really wanted a strong base of a of a good script because so many people are just in a hurry to make a movie that they just like. We'd done so many indie films where we'd you know we we'd seen from the outside or the inside you know as actors how much work it is and and how people you know put years of their life into it and we're just like oh if the script had been just better like you know then they could have really had something here and so we wanted to really have a have a good script and being you know from the theater we had all these amazing actors that, that that was never a question that we that we had people to draw from um and uh so we sort of you know had 15 people in our back pockets for every part that we could have pulled from and so the casting was was really fun but the downside yeah. of that is everyone's like you never put me in your movie <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah people. <laughs> yeah that's an amazing lineup did you write all the parts for for them for the supporting roles um sometimes like barry's part uh barry's barry we didn't know barry uh <laughs> so that was like we, we we gotta get a star name to come in for a day and do and do some more and so that he was our big star name that we <laughs> that we booked that's amazing but, uh, and, he's such and, a delight that... yes and then now he does stuff for cheap for us <laughs> <laughs> because he likes us but uh but he cost a little bit at the beginning but everyone else should pay barry a lot because yes. he's worth it he's really wonderful <laughs> how did you put together the crew how did you all meet well chad we were um in an improv group with in college and uh he, he well chad yeah I, yeah i had uh I had several friends that, uh, I, although I went to UC San Diego, uh, I had several friends at uh, um, San Francisco State, and they kind of honorarily snuck me into their improv group, and we all did 
comedy together. We actually, and but me being a, a, a videographer and editor, you know, at the time, um, <laughs> instead of structural engineering, which was my actual major, um, we would make uh, little shorts and little intros for the uh, improv shows together. So we were had a little bit of experience um, filming little parody skits, and we did a cops parody. We did a you know the uh, required um, uh, Blair Witch parody, uh, as were the times. And um, yeah, so you know, we were used to working together, and um, yeah, all ended up in LA about the same time. And although I wasn't the initial editor, I was kind of, I kind of came in and on the second pass. Um, that, that you was part just of a whole other thing. Was you that... just had a baby. You were our first choice, yeah, but you, you just had it. a baby. That's true. And, and, and there was some post-production drama, which <laughs> I don't oh, yeah. have time for. But, um, and so, and then, then you saved us. he swooped in and saved the day. Swooped in at the last minute, yeah. Gabe did some very brave work. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Yeah, so very, most of the time, I mean, editing shouldn't really stand out it should tell the story without calling attention to itself which is really hard to promote yourself as an editor when you're like see that you didn't notice anything that i did but um those who had seen the first cut versus what uh gabe and ed and i sat down and, and cranked out to uh to revise it people were coming up to me mentioning like what the changes were and how how much of an impact it was so it was really nice to actually get feedback for editing because usually if you're doing your job right it, it kind of doesn't stand out uh jeff and matthias how, how did we find you trevor al trevor we found matthias and trevor right yeah i had worked with the line producer and the ad team um and i just i interviewed for the job i remember the interview because they asked me if I'd worked with the red camera before the red camera had just come out and it was revolutionizing the industry and i was like yeah the red camera Definitely worked with it before, <laughs> which I hadn't, but, but it was all the buzz and I Googled what it was all about. And it was like, well, it's just like film. So if you shoot film, shouldn't be an issue. So I said, yes, I shot the red camera. And this was the first movie that I shot on the red. What? <laughs> Sorry, I, I lied, no guys. <laughs> Get out of the Zoom. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's the same. You light, you light, you expose. Wow. You put we on a lens. Oh, it's all BS. Thank you for being a liar. <laughs> <laughs> you remember like... going over the uh, in that little apartment or in that little house I had in LA, and we were going over the going over all the shots. And my my son was like potty training in the living room. <laughs> you were awesome. You were great. You were so patient. And you were great. <laughs> And he was a replacement because the other person uh, dropped out when we said we're using the red camera and we weren't going to be paying him to rent his camera. <laughs> and he was like, I'm out of here. Okay. And so it was like the week week before or something, right, Matthias? Um, oof, yeah, it was very, very close to the date that we started for sure. Uh, it was for the best. It was a match made in heaven. And Jeff, we found through, I, I did like a, a mass email to everyone I knew uh, professionally to be like, do you know any good film composers? And uh, we interviewed a couple and Jeff was just, uh, uh, we met Star. at a cafe and he was amazing and gave him a scene to like, uh, the scene where I walk up, there's a scene where I walk up to the attic and I'm sort of in a trance. We're like, can you do sort of like a poltergeisty type of thing? And it was just totally just nailed it. And I think it's exactly the same thing that's in the final film. Yeah, I don't think that got changed at all from the beginning to the end. And I don't know who, who gave you, I think, did you say that Scott Ackerman or something gave you yep. my name? Which I've never met him, but I did... Uh, some some music for some skits through somebody else that ended up that he was in um so i'm glad that it was good enough for him to know who i was to send you that recommendation he barely knows who i am we, we did his, <laughs> his show once and i had his email and i'm surprised he even bothered to respond he would not remember me now it's been so long Maybe he's one of those people who just actually keeps like a Rolodex. And so like he can seem like he knows everybody. Uh, I mean, that's not a bad way to do business. Yeah, let me just go back to quickly. Uh, I think, Gabe, you said you didn't end up using any of the things you initially planned for. Where, where, where was the house that ended up in the film? Emily? 
The one we used or the one we were going to the, use? The one you used. Oh. oh, that was in LA. Okay. That was in, uh, what, uh, where was it? It's the West Ham. It's the house bunny house. Right. That's right. Uh, it was uh, um, a scam know. artist who had this house who he would rent out to productions and then uh, extort them for money afterwards, which he told us that he extorted a bunch of money from the pony. <laughs> and then he had all that, all those sex toys in the ba in the attic. You remember? Yeah. When he was showing us around, there were all these sex toys in the attic, uh, which was fun. very weird. Very, very strange. And then uh, and then I, he said, I would never do that to you. And then after it, he like, was like, you owe me eight dollars for a roll of, to of uh, toilet paper. And, uh, you owe me all this money for all this damage you caused. And it was uh, that was a fun legal situation to, to deal with. And then wow. we later, our friend works at Film LA. He didn't even own the house. <laughs> he was pretending like he owned the house. He was like, he was renting it. He was yeah. renting it for fun. It was just. And you're not allowed to, you know, do that if you're. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's go into. I think that it's the first time we properly do this. Let's go uh, into deep dive into one of the scenes. Uh, I'll, I'll sh show the video first, and I think we have the entire crew here. You can all talk about what went into planning, editing, music, and everything. Let me show this two minute, uh, amazing, like well orchestrated montage. Hi, welcome. Thanks for coming, Ted, Nancy, George, Suzette, Vivian, Mavis, Felipe. Welcome. Thank you for coming. The place is built in 1906, so lots of history here. Just perfect for a couple starting out. Just perfect for a couple on a fixed income. Just perfect for someone looking for a fresh start. Perfect place for your cats. Uh huh. This is the pantry. Lots of cupboard space. A bit drafty sometimes. This is the kitchen. Running water. Like any old house, it has its quirks. Good. What? What? Bleeding walls. Sometimes the bedroom closet becomes a portal to the spirit realm. That does not happen in the master bathroom. I don't want you to get out. Then why did you tell us to get out? He didn't say it. I don't recommend ever going up into the attic for any reason whatsoever. But the attic is my favorite room of any house. Not this one. So what do you think? Seriously? I don't know. No. What, how much? We're not interested. Mm, no. How much? <laughs> that's amazing wow it's been a while since i've seen that yeah <laughs> my kids watch that movie every halloween by the way nice did they really <laughs> do it's the now on peacock thanks to film yeah. club well I, I own the dvd well <laughs> hey i own like seven thousand <laughs> <laughs> Give it back. There were some good uh, <laughs> practical effects in that uh, sequence, right? I, I do remember I wanted the them all to be practical, but they weren't. Yeah. <laughs> so the they PA did. jammed on top of the, the cupboards, opening and closing the doors. And the string, we had a string on the uh, faucet from the outside yeah. of the window. Beautiful. Fishing wire. That's like my favorite shot in the movie. Fishing wire. Yeah. It's funny because every time I see it, I don't notice it turn on. I'm like, I wonder how many people notice it turn on. I only see it turn it off. Damn, that's smooth. Every time. Yes. Yep. <laughs> yeah. but, the, but the toilet but, and the wall, we could never quite. Yeah, we, we had some practical effects people. <laughs> we had this whole toilet. And it had like this bubbling goo and it was supposed to shoot in my face. And it was like, just, it was not shooting. It in was my bubbling, face. barely. Yeah. And Emily's like, get your face closer. Get your face closer. Like, I'm going to get my face closer to, to the toilet. Uh, so that was, uh, that was post-production uh, trying to uh, salvage it. 
how, how, how did it, so, so uh, was this sequence written like this uh, from early on? Yeah, this was, mm -hmm. this was like a lot of the sort of trailer mm -hmm. moments that sort of mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. uh, came to us as we were like thinking about what we could do with this premise. So like all the, this, these were a lot of the initial thoughts of just like <laughs> a goofy guy trying to sell uh, a spooky house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How, how long did it oh i'm sorry go ahead i was just gonna say like this is part of hiring like people who you know are amazing because every single one of those people is incredible and so funny and um like for instance um melinda peterson who just recently passed away and uh phil proctor the two older people she came she's so funny and um she came in with her own wig because <laughs> she thought her character would have have that hair instead of her, you know, fun dyed hair that she had. And, um, you know, they're doing their little shtick and because they're amazing actors. And, you know, like every like every single one of those people is so funny and like came in with little characters and like. Yeah, the, the attic is my favorite room in any house. That was yeah. an improvisation. Like, Trey is just this amazing improviser slash hairdresser slash writer slash everything like and you know just all of those people would just bring something amazing and like just like what are you gonna do like, yeah we didn't have to worry so much about, yeah. <laughs> about casting yeah I think there was more from him that that we couldn't use we like we like he was you know he kept going with he had plenty of little grains of granules that we wanted to use but uh you know you had to fit had to fit in only a certain time. Although, although uh, this is probably the first project I worked on in general, as far as an editing note, that uh, we weren't trying to reduce. We're trying to just like keep it say, oh, I can't lose too much. We still gotta be ninety minutes, which is a great time for a lighthearted, you know, kind of movie to keep it right to ninety minutes. But we're you know trying to firm things up here and and running into the danger of getting too short. So we wanted it to still be a feature. Wow. There were, there were corners that, need, that needed to be cut during production that like made sequences a little bit smaller. And so it was, you know. Such, we had such a tight script and then we're like, oh, it didn't need to be that tight. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. How about the editing and the music? Music, did that flow naturally? Well, I don't remember if I got this scene. I feel like this was one that came later uh, in the process, but I don't remember exactly. And if, I mean, how much, because this was so uh, scored to the moments, like you have a scene change and you have a kind of a energy shift when you see uh, Gabe with the cabinets going. And so you have all these kind of hit points where things shift. Um, and I don't remember if this was one that was already pretty much exactly where it needed to be, or if it's one that underwent slight changes, but this was also um, a part of the trailer. So I don't, I think we might've actually done the trailer music first and then this was the scene or we did the scene. I, I don't remember what the order was, but it was pretty tight and we just knew that it was going to be thematically like the main this is kind of like the the nexus point of a lot of the music of the movie because all the different themes come together because you have all these different moments uh, colliding and and moving into each other. And Jeff's music really ties the whole movie together and just and gives it the tone. This is uh, this sequence is kind of a reprise of the the main titles, which I don't know if that came after we did this or after we did the trailer or whatever, but like. I think we'd given him, uh, Emily, correct me if I'm wrong, we'd given, given him the Ghost of Mr. Chicken soundtrack, which is a great, like, swinging 60s spooky soundtrack. And uh, uh, what, not the Adams Family, the other one. Um, Monsters. Monsters. And that's, like, <laughs> great. Um, I, I'm going to say, too, that, like, there are a lot of setups there. And we did a lot of setups in a very short period of time. And Matias was orchestrated that that crew in a way that he would move them around and we would have these setups so fast. It was unbelievable how fast we would be ready. We would move on to the next shot, like go to the, go into the kitchen. And before we knew it, we were all ready to go. I mean, it was, uh, it's really unheard of. People, there was not a lot of waiting around. I mean, it happened for sure, of course, but we tried to 
really respectful of everyone's time. And I just thought I was always impressed with the setups and how you orchestrated the crew and how you work with them. It was, I, know, I just found it really, you were a great leader in that way, Matthias. You really are. And you can see why you've done 40. <laughs> I've done 40, but in the time of 10. <laughs> <laughs> And he's so even keeled. He's and, so calm. Yeah, he's not yelling and barking orders. It's it's really lovely to have him on set. Very good energy. <laughs> Very collaborative and easy and just seamless, you know? I mean, just really seamless. I always remind myself that we're making movies, you know? We're not we're not saving the world. We're not, um, we're not saving lives. We all got into this business, at least some of us, most of us, the present company, because we love it. Um, so I, I try to always to remember that when I'm on set, we're just, we're doing our hobby for, for a living and there's no reason to get worked up. Calm, cool and collected and fun. That's how it should be. Yep. That was, it. and it, it was a great, I, I mean, I feel like I'm touched that we're all here again. And thank you for liking our movie so much to have us back. I mean, it's just, it's a real honor to like be talking about it after over a dozen of what 15 years i mean however long it's been so. absolutely five years. Five long years no we <laughs> shot in uh 2009 right wow yeah yeah i think that's right yeah that seemed like yesterday and we've all stayed in touch which um which speaks for the connection we made for sure that's and awesome. we all look great we all look, <laughs> the same. We all look exactly the same we're all 25 <laughs> you see what i can I add something? Um, what I really like about this, it doesn't really matter. I mean, even if it's a, a title, which is now, yeah. By the way, it doesn't look all, uh, dated to me, but um, that's not the point. But what I mean is, I learned this from also back to Werner Herzog. Like he came, and that's so cool about independent film. He came into the game owning his catalog, like building a catalog and at least co-owning it still. And that's what also was a bit of what made me like want to do this here is that um, that the system has changed so radically that you know you have no more ownership you have no more you know you uh, you 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 do one thing after another and I mean I've worked like I have some anecdotes like you know in, international filmmakers directors from France so starting in Hollywood basically getting ripped off having no rights having the career destroyed by making some you know had not even a chance to make to not make a mistake um and here you know like, like Werner started it like having a string of movies he still owns Fitzgeraldo and you know that's still his catalog and to that's the opportunity of course everyone wants to make larger budget films and have more freedom um <laughs> and that's sometimes good I think actually constraints are great for creativity um but I I, I think having this you know, building a catalog could be a new chance of actually for the for the independent film and that's why i thank you for this like you you put something off which looks it looks totally like you know high production value it looks like everything else and I, I mean in a good way right like it doesn't it doesn't feel like uh oh this was done it's really like inventive and um i felt also that I never had the chance to be so inventive on large budget films there's so much pressure so many mm. uh, constraints not on a, a creative way but he can actually do like what you just said about the music. And like many times, like um, the marketing guys did showed us what actually movie was supposed to be. <laughs> uh, because that's the fun thing. I, I remember on Big Brother, like on, I remember, um, what was it? Um, the Keanu Reeves film. Um, um, in the middle of like all oh, this mess, they showed us the trailer. We're like, this is the movie we should be making. You know, why are you making it so complicated? But there's no way to, no way back. Like, you know, if you, write the trailer music, you will probably not have the chance to do this on a big budget film. Um, but you can actually, you have more more room for freedom. And uh, uh, that's what I really love about this indie film, about about what you guys are doing and you know, hopefully what we can bring to the table to it. But this has its, you know, the title has its life, a movie has a life and doesn't just get done and it's a thing you forget and do the next one. Yeah, that's why I love doing what I'm doing here, what, what, what you guys do. Awesome. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, next question, I want each of you to answer this, I think, looking back after like, almost 15 years since making of the film, what was one thing that you uh, would have done differently 
today with, with your knowledge and experience? Probably just intellectually, my first thought is budget. I didn't budget more for post and marketing and things that we didn't, you know, we got the movie in the can and then we were like, oh, <laughs> we need more money. You know, we need money for things. And uh, so just being a more uh, prepared, you know, for, for that. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of other creative things and a million things, but that's my first thought is just because of business, the business thought is like, did allocate funds in a different way. But I, I don't know how we could have had done it with less initially, but I mean, just not being aware of, I think if I, we had more going into it now, we have so much more knowledge about saving the funds for things that you need that that come up, you know. It, w it was our film school. Like it was like really just yeah. um, uh, making a lot of mistakes and learning and having that sort of uh, not knowing what we didn't know. So not, not <laughs> like there's, there was, there's something to like, just, just diving in. Um, that's like if we had known, we might not have dived in. Um, so I'm I'm grateful that we were kind of ignorant of some things, but um, we're we're very lucky we're able to kind of pull it out uh, in the end. Um, but yeah, I, what I would change is I would have more money. <laughs> I, would, I would just be rich and then uh, <laughs> have more money. Uh, that definitely, but I would have uh, worked in production instead of temping in the corporate world and working in fashion as my day jobs so that I knew what was going on more because as an actor you don't really it's really hard to pick things up uh you know like I would always be watching everything on set but as an actor you're hardly ever on set so it's hard to like the first time I worked after directing a movie I was like so much more relaxed than I ever had been before because I wasn't like always I wasn't worried that I was gonna have to shoot in five minutes because I I knew like that it was gonna be three hours because I I knew you know oh we have to do this and they're gonna do that and then this turnaround and that turnaround and all you had to do was say your and lines all I had to do was say my lines <laughs> I didn't have to worry about every single other thing and it was just like, I was actually relaxed on set for like maybe the first time in my life and I couldn't believe it. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, it was, I, yeah, I would have worked in production instead of temping and, and working in fashion, so. How about uh, Matthias? Um, well, I'm glad to hear Klaus thinks it looks like everything else because I'm pretty critical of my work in general and, um, most of the time when I see another DP's work, I think it looks way better than anything that I've shot. So right. my, my, my thought would be, I, I would have lit things differently here and there, but um, you know, it is, it's a time constraint. It was a budgetary constraint considering the lights we had and everything, but I think every movie is a learning process. I think I probably could have done it slightly better now, but I am glad to hear that it aged well and, and looks like everything else. Yeah, it's funny. I when I first saw the cut, I think one of the first things that really stood out to me was the quality of the you know the photography um, and just like how everything was framed and just the composition of everything is just like it. You know, obviously it's you don't you don't want that to like overcome the story, but it really actually popped out with how um, good it looked. Which you know, I get that feeling critical of um, of of your work and, and, you know, always wanting to do better, but it was impressively uh, good looking to me when I first saw uh, the, the shots. I know Emily, Emily and I sat down for many, many hours and planned out and storyboarded some of those sequences. And it's definitely satisfying, you know, when you, when you achieve maybe 70% of the shots that you, you planned. Um, we got a lot of them. You got a lot of them, yeah, and and you can feel it. It feels it feels pre decided, you know. You can you can feel it when a, a sequence has a, a structure that was already put into place beforehand. So that was nice. Yeah, we had a lot of time. We spent a lot of time in post. So I there's uh, as I watch the movie, there's nothing I go back and say. Oh, I wish we, you know. I mean, we 
we went over every little scrap as much as possible. I think there's there's no like editing decision that I look back on and say, oh, we could have done that differently because we put in a lot of time and we looked at all the extra takes and, and any limitations that were there uh, were just because of budgetary constraints or not enough time for another take or this you couldn't that wall didn't work or this you know effect didn't work or whatever. Um, so really, my only my only thing I would do differently looking back was a decision to try and get a little work done while my uh, while my not yet toddler, while my crawling uh, stage daughter was kind of at my heels. I thought, oh, I can get a little something done. But no, she was just uh, on the floor. You're fine, right? <laughs> Except she grabbed one of the hard drives. I don't know if you remember those Lassie hard drives that would stand up like this. I had it down on the floor and she used it to pull herself up. But of course, oh. the drive, slam! <laughs> and it's made this clicking noise. And I was like, oh, God. <laughs> and I forgot about that. And then I had to track down, luckily, through uh, another job that I had. I knew someone that could help transcode red files into, because you couldn't edit the native file. So I had to take the name. We had to back, we had a backup, but I had to get them all the footage transcoded again. Um, just because I was trying to do like five more minutes of work you know, in around my parenting duties, but that was a mistake that cost me a lot of time. But in the end, we had time, so we put it all, put all the pieces back together, and uh, and it doesn't show the final product. But I would definitely do that differently. <laughs> <laughs> Work life. Uh, uh, That's amazing. I would say oh. the only the only thing that that I would do differently um, would be for the kind of ambient or you know things that aren't in a groove or a beat. I didn't map um my demos to a click track i just kind of played them on the keyboard and then i was like oh well i'll just do it later and then when it came time to you know get the, the at live strings and the you know live musicians to play it i the beat was all over the place and so i was like da, 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 and i didn't know where it was and i had done the whole movie that way um, with everything that wasn't in like an actual groove um and so that was a little um challenging mm. to to finish up when i didn't prepare well from the start kasu probably have something to share about tempo mapping yeah sure <laughs> yeah, yeah no no but i'll leave you to it too many stories but i am um, <laughs> um no no but you again like, like i said like you know i, I can only give you like you know the the to, to have the freedom I mean of course when you when you do a movie like this um, meaning with no money <laughs> you're like you want more money but if you do I mean it sounds maybe wrong but like if you have unlimited money it doesn't get better right and it's um and you I, I I'm the most I actually had the most fun in retrospect you can never say you can never talk about the fun and the creativity why you're doing it because it's to me always super painful besides like you know I don't have a single score I would think I wouldn't be still working on it if I wouldn't have taken it away from me to to release the <laughs> film. Seriously, um, um, and you know, editors like you know, they're not they're not better than us composers. They, I've seen editors after the premiere in the editing room. I mean, everything. Uh, you probably do this too, but um, no, it's that it, you have the just like it is so much lighter if you compare to be creative, and ultimately, like later on when you reflect on it, like you know. This actually would, these are the anecdotes are usually not from the big movies, they are actually from those which are creative and like you have more constraints. So, sorry, saying the same thing over and over again. But yeah, when I, when I hear you talk about the, the like the fun you had, like, you know, I think about like all the, all the stress I have often on these bigger movies. So it, it is actually really so much more fun to, to be able to create and uh, have a smaller team actually. And I understand, you know, you, Sure, you could have a couple of dollars more left and right um, here and there. I, I get it, you know. I, yeah. I, go ahead, sorry. What? I just want to say that you said we had the whole crew here. And I want to make sure everyone listening knows there are a lot of people here that worked on it that aren't represented. Absolutely, like yeah. a lot of people put a lot of hard work in it that aren't here today. So um, there yeah. are a lot of them. So thank you for everyone who worked on it. Really, they're, they're, these are the, there's a lot of, People here did a lot of great work on it, but there's there's a lot of people that aren't here. So, okay. Uh, my next question. Let's have a fun, stupid question. So, if we're making this same, uh, if we're making 
a film based on the same premise in 2023. Like let's have a little brainstorming session, like what that <laughs> film would, would look, look like, what's the story. Well, this, the house would sell right away. Yeah, that's how I it, yeah. $3 million dollars. <laughs> and the movie would be over. <laughs> I, I, I saw a Reddit thread with someone saying, should he get a house that's like 100K under market price because there was a murder suicide inside? And the comment section was all like, I'll clean up the body myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would be, uh, it would be uh, maybe you could have the ghosts fighting for... Uh... Yeah, I was just going to say, it's the other way around, right? <laughs> now, now it's the point of view of the ghost. It's the ghost is the guy with the problem, not the real estate. It's like, how do I get these people out? Like, you get one family out. That was easy. You know, back in the 60s, this was easy. Just a little blood and a little, some flies. Boom. But now with the housing market, the, these people will not leave. I hit them with the Newell post last night and they just didn't, they just rolled over and back to sleep. So yeah, that would be, that would be interesting. So the, that sequel, I said, we have to call in the old cast, maybe. Yeah, oh, the I ghost has the problem I, reaches out to I you. Know, I know what it is. Is uh, it's a uh, anti flipper, anti flipper movie. No, oh, prevent the, the flip from happening. It's the ghost, yeah, it's uh, in with the gray, uh, with the gray laminate to rip up the hardwood floor, and the ghosts have to stop the right. No subway tile. <laughs> right, the cheap flippers. Yeah, are the, are the, yeah. The yeah. Yeah, or maybe they're filming a, a TV show. Maybe they're trying to shoot a TV show or fake it or something, or do maybe they're doing something skeezer, trying to, yeah, launch themselves as uh, flipping influencers, and the house has to, you know, bring the hammer down on them. They put the stuff, they put everything, all the surfaces down. The ghost uh, pops it all up, and then like they have to figure out what the ghost likes, and they'll leave because the ghost has good taste, and they have bad. Taste. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, they have to go back out of the library and crack those old books and see what old Victorians, like how it was really supposed to be made. Oh, this is how the eaves should be and the fascia board. And yeah, do all that real pain and rejects all that. Yeah. 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 Hmm. That's amazing. Any more ideas? And a talking dog. <laughs> <laughs> you got to have a talking dog. We would That's have gotten awesome. into Sundance if we'd had a talking dog. <laughs> <laughs> no, wait, a dragon. Isn't there supposed to be a dragon? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, we really? went to the market and there was a guy who was like... If you, can you add a dragon to the first five minutes? And we're like, mm -hmm. Dragons are going to be huge. And he was right, because Game of Thrones was uh, hadn't even uh, happened yet. So uh, it shows what we know. So that was an actual, that was an actual meeting? That, yeah. you ha that you had because I, I oh, yeah. you know I remember seeing it in in the next movie and uh, uh, I, I wasn't sure if that one was a real one yeah, yeah. it was real that was real <laughs> add a dragon to the first five minutes sure <laughs> a note for a completed feature hey just go back get a dragon in there yeah okay <laughs> that's how this works that's amazing. I, I have more questions I want to ask, but we are almost out of time. Let me give it a turn it to the team. So if you have any questions, please uh, briefly introduce yourself uh, and then ask your questions. Getting nervous. <laughs> I was going to bring this up earlier um, when we were talking about Barry, but can you mention how Barry showed up to the set? With, with, with all of his bring some, he brought, brought his own stuff. Yeah, all of his exorcist yeah. stuff was just like he loves props and he makes his own props. Oh like, wow! Like, yeah. Amazing. That's awesome. Okay, I I have a yeah. question. <laughs> Who was like the person that was like the most like ghost friendly kind of on set? Who is like, like kind of like driving, you know, kind of more of like the, um, you know, like um, at a, like some of your your characters' parts that was like, hey, these are like these are actually like ghost people. So like for instance, I had a really funny. I did a ghost tour once in San Francisco with 
with Tommy, who is the uh, the head of the SF Ghost Society and like knew everything about <laughs> ghosts and everything. And um, who is the person that was kind of like, you know, the most in, in depth with ghosts? <laughs> That's who uh, Christian we, we know the guy who who, who, does, who does the it ghost now. does it yeah. now, yeah. Our, who does the ghost knowledge. the ghost hunt? Um, I think it was more. There, I remember an interviewer at a at a film festival uh, who was very into ghosts, and I feel like th that lady was uh, wanted to talk about how real ghosts were <laughs> during the, during the Q and A. Uh, that's awesome. <laughs> you can you think of anyone on set, Emily? Like a ghost expert. Yeah, like, who's your go? Yeah, who's your ghost expert? That's a very simple way of asking the question. Who is your like? Who is your consulting source? You know, we probably made it be Edda because it was her character. <laughs> but I did a lot of I did a lot of research and was like really in interested in that stuff when I was a kid, and so I, I had the encyclopedia of ghosts and spirits that had been on my bookshelf forever. So like, all of the different like ghost, uh, what you call it, um, theory that her character had was all all stuff that I knew and had researched. So I guess it was me, I guess. There I you go, it. that's the answer. Oh. <laughs> awesome, that's cool. Anyone else? Okay, if no more questions, I wanna quickly ask everyone, uh, so what's your future project? What's something you're currently working on? Let's go first. You do. I yeah. guess. Well, uh, we've been, we wrote a script that ended up getting on something called The Blacklist, which is a thing in Los Angeles. And that sort of led to us uh, sort of doing professional screenwriting stuff. So we've been doing that for a while and uh and which is great but also has its frustrations if nothing ever gets made uh so um we're sort of itching to uh to make another movie here soon but um so we're thinking of thinking about that and trying to figure out you know what we can do on our own as opposed to like trying to go through the regular channels which is very frustrating mm -hmm. but i've been uh to sort of scratch my itch i i started a um instagram and about this ridiculous mustache. I have an Instagram and TikTok at Mark Twain today. It's about Mark Twain trying to be a social media star. So I get to sort of work out sort of my uh, creative uh, stuff uh, doing that. So it's very, very silly sketches and uh, movie reviews and Mark Twain trying to do dances and whatnot. I'll blurt out mine real quick. Um, I have a couple of movies in post. One's currently called The Method, and it stars Kathleen Turner and um, Jackie Earl Haley. It's a film noir. And I have a, a very low budget, half French, half American comedy called Bigfoot Je T'aime, about Bigfoot being found in Normandy. <laughs> I have two movies hopefully coming up that I'm shooting. One other one for Ryuhei Kitamura. It's a thriller and uh, a romantic comedy for uh, director Viveka Muasia, who I've worked with twice before also. An American great. Sasquatch in Paris. Hell yeah. <laughs> That'll be the sequel. Big Foot yeah. Jatim is a great title. <laughs> yeah, it's a great title. It's funny. You guys should come to the screening November 1st. All right. Which one is November 1st? We just have a cast and crew screening of Big Foot Jatim on November 1st. Oh, how fun. That sounds awesome. Is it in French? It's half in French, half in English. Okay. It's about an American documentary filmmaker who goes to Normandy to pick up where her father left off and and uh, save slash discover Bigfoot who has been moved to France. Is it a comedy or is it a uh, not a comedy? Oh, it's a comedy. It's like I always say it's like um, it's like the Big Lebowski meets um, Harry and the Hendersons. It's awesome. like a stoner version of Harry and the Hendersons. <laughs> nice. A stoner version of Harry. <laughs> version. Your version. Well, I have I'm in the super early stages of my next movie that uh is just being worked out. The script isn't finished or anything, but it's called Diablo Shadows and it is, also has ghosts in it and it's much darker and not as funny. <laughs> That's all I got for now. Yeah, I guess I'm uh I'm starting to work uh more on 
just little real little animations and reels and kind of some comedy stuff. I'm going to be trying to explore some some new things that I can do in my own little workshop studio. But uh, I also like to doing you know, like crafting tutorials and like building stuff and making stuff. I've been doing sculpture and painting and for a few years now, and so trying to kind of bring it all back together and maybe get back into filmmaking, but. I'm always tempted to try and do things that I can control 100% myself. So, because my time is, you know, is just so divided with the other stuff I have to do. So, um, but, you know, it would be nice to be a part of a big project again, but uh, you know, we'll see. What's your Instagram? Oh, at Chad Meserve, just C H A D M E S E R V E, like reserve, but with an M. There's some um, real fun stuff on there. Yeah, his, his art is great. Thank you. Um, and I'm pretty much just, uh, I've been working with my band, Here Lies Man, um, for the last bunch of years, uh, mostly playing live. But of course, in the pandemic, we've been recording and uh, making a new album, which is almost done. And I am just spend my days pretty much in the studio making random music uh, and doing TikTok videos of uh, me playing along and, and making just weird stuff and 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 seeing what works. What's, your... What's that? You're What's doing your... What's your handle? Oh, right. my handle. Uh, it's uh, Jeff G E O F F the man M A N N. Jeff the man. That's Everywhere. Great. That's where you can find me. All right, that's awesome. I, I really want to stay on this just to hang out with you guys for like another hour, but uh, we all have to go back to work. <laughs> But thank you so much for your time. This is amazing. Thank you for sharing all the stories. And uh, <laughs> we look forward to all your future projects. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Nice them. to meet you guys. Yeah. Thank Thanks you. for everything. Thank you. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye.